I was not attending uh, Congress this uh, last year um, uh, because uh, I just uh, moved into a new house and uh, had lots of other things to do. And then I still wanted to take a break from all the uh, you know building renovation and other things and wanted to have some fun and I decided I should do something that is not related to GSM. Um, or uh, the other things that I do all the time. So I thought, okay, let's have a look at these deck base stations that uh, are used now also by uh, the POC, the phone operation center at the CCC events. So um, why DECT? Well, because I already have some history with DECT, which was about 10 years ago. There was a project called dedecte.org that I was uh, slightly involved with. I didn't really do all of the technical stuff. But still, um, at that time, a group of security researchers were uh, um, uh, publishing security problems in the DECT standard and in implementations of uh, DECT systems at the time. Um, and well, DECT is an Etsy standard, so it's uh, always fun to work with ITU and Etsy standards and to look at obscure communication systems. It's also still very much used today and contrary to uh, GSM or UMTS, uh, we haven't really heard of anyone talking about a sunset of DECT. Um, so it's uh, likely going to be around for quite some more time. And as I said, the CCC Phone Operation Center, the event phone guys have also switched to a one specific vendor or one specific system that implements DECT. Um, so the um, uh, terminology that we are going to be using here, among other things, uh, actually, uh, yeah, the slides were just in time production, so the terminology is not complete. So an RFP is a radio fixed part. There's also a PP, which is the portable part. So the MS, which, which is also called the UE in our world, uh, is called the PP here. And the RFP is more like a VTS in our terminology. And then in the DECT uh, system by this company that we are looking here, we also have the OM, um, which is the Open Mobility Manager, which is more like an MSC or something like that in our uh, coming from a GSM, looking at this from the GSM angle. So um, let's, I don't really want to talk too much about DECT, uh, just a very few things uh, in the beginning about it. It's a TDMA system um, uh, working in somewhere between 1.8 and 1.9 gigahertz uh, range. So we have time slots uh, like in GSM, we have uh, carriers like ARFCANs like in GSM. Um, they're just a bit more wideband uh, than GSM carriers, um, but otherwise relatively similar. Um, so we also have some broadcast channels and some dedicated channels and things like that. Um, also, interestingly, the DLC protocol, uh, data link control, I think is how they call it, is very much like LabDM, but not the same. So we have a rather similar layer two protocol than GSM uh, inside those uh, dedicated channels. Interestingly, they slice another protocol layer in between. So there's a MAC protocol layer between DLC and uh, uh, the physical layer. So uh, LabDM is not directly on the on the radio channel, uh, again looking at this from a uh, GSM point of view. And then in the end, uh, they also have some layer 3 protocols like uh, call control and mobility management, um, which are in principle doing more or less the same things like we see in GSM, but of course they are encoded completely different. So of course we also have a setup message, but the TLVs are different and the information element identifiers are different and so on. So it's really uh, looks like um, uh, you know, you, you tell two groups of developers, uh, develop a, a TDMA-based uh, radio system communication system and it should offer telephony services and all of them have some pre-existing knowledge about ISDN and then the two of them create GSM and DECT. Um, uh, and same ideas, same principles, but completely different encoding and lots of differences in the details. Um, so. Uh, one big difference, though, compared to GSM is that uh, in DECT, in the specs, only the radio interface is specified. So, um, the, uh, uh, in, in GSM, we know there are all the different interfaces in the infrastructure, uh, the radio interface and the, the ABIS and A and all the, the network elements, the MSC, the BSC, all of that is specified in rather uh, comprehensive detail. Um, whereas in DECT, they only specify the radio interface and they basically say, well, if you do anything on the infrastructure side, it's up to you. 
um, right? And and the common use case that you find in uh, in homes uh, basically looks like this. Um, we can of course make that larger if we remember how to do it. Control plus. Yes, um, that's what I'm trying. Ah, there we go. So. Um, yeah, so we have uh, two portable parts, um, we have radio interface, we have one fixed part, and then there's a POTS, ISD, and SIP, whatever connection, and that's your, your cordless phone at home. Um, which is, of course, rather uh, obvious that you don't want to specify that there is a BTS and a BSC and an MSC and whatnot in there, and there are all kinds of protocols in there. I mean, it's basically a NITB, right, uh, from our uh, point of view. And if we look at larger installations, then the network uh, grows and becomes more hierarchical. So um, we have multiple of those radio fixed parts and they have some whatever proprietary backhaul protocol to whatever proprietary core, which then talks ISDN or SIP or whatever to external uh, telephony systems out there. Um, and that's basically the kind of system that we're looking at, and uh, we want to look at these proprietary bits and at these RFPs, which are the base stations in uh, DEC uh, technology. So the protocol stacking looks like this. Um, if we uh, uh, want to look at the usual protocol stack diagrams that we know from other cellular technology, we have the physical layer here in the portable part in the phone. We have a Mac layer with the DLC layer on top, and then we have the NWK layer, which is basically what we know as layer three, which contains call control and mobility management messages. Um, in this particular implementation, then we have an RFP which doesn't do anything else but implementing the FI and the MAC layer. And then we have some backhaul to a central network element which is called the OM, which implements basically the DLC and the NWK layers. Um, and here in between we have a TCP IP based protocol that I called AAMIDE, AAMIDE, which is the AASTRA MITEL DEC protocol. No, we don't know how this protocol is called. It's a proprietary protocol between two network elements and I had to come up with an acronym that wasn't used yet. So um, I came up with uh, this rather uh, handsome acronym. Um, so let's look a little bit at these uh, DEC base stations, the RFPs. There's multiple generations of those devices. Um, I've only seen Gen 2, 3 and 4 base stations. I don't know what Gen 1 looked like. Uh, of course, we have to keep in mind that traditionally, of course, this proprietary interface here was probably more something like ISDN or so in older uh, DEC installations. But now in the modern days, of course, this is uh, IP based and that's also the, the case for what I analyzed. So at least these Gen 2, 3 and 4 base stations are all IP based. So the Gen 2 RFPs have an interesting ancient TI uh, MIPS with dual DSP processor. I only know the, the from, from TI the uh, ARM plus uh, DSP uh, uh, processors, but apparently they also did some MIPS uh, CPUs some time ago. Um, and uh, there's some NAND flash, uh, some RAM, an Ethernet Phi, and an MPCI slot for, not MPCIe, right? It's still MPCI, the old for Wi-Fi cards. And next to that, there is a DEC baseband processor uh, with its own flash and RAM um, and some whatever ADPCM chip, so some codec uh, uh, chip and an actual 16C550 UART. Um, I haven't seen those in a long day, um, you know, ever since I would say at least the early 90s, I haven't seen a physical uh, 16C550 yet. So, um, those are not so exciting because basically there's entirely only proprietary software on those components and um, it's not as easily hackable. But what becomes rather interesting is the generation three RFPs, which are uh, at least two of them are RFP 35 and RFP 43. Um, these are the product numbers because they contain a Marvel Kirkwood uh, ARM SOC. If you've ever played with a Shiva plug, uh, then you know these devices. and. They actually run an almost, I think, apart, it's probably like 100 lines of patch or even less, no, less than 100 lines of patch compared to mainline Linux uh, on there, uh, 3.2.73 kernel. Um, and uh, the Kirkwood has two Ethernet ports, one points to the DECT baseband processor and the other one points to the backhaul. So you basically have a completely open, freely programmable, mainline Linux supported Linux chip next to the DEC processor, or in between the DEC processor and the backhaul uh, of those devices. Um, the uh, DEC processor used is not yet known at this point. Nobody has unsolded the shielding cover yet uh, of a device. 
uh, it wasn't really necessary uh, at this point. And you have uh, an accessible serial console for U-Boot and Linux access, and the root password is actually known, uh, even without spelling uh, mistakes, and, uh, and it's even officially documented. So basically, whatever password you configure in your OMM backend um, is actually pushed down to the RFPs. So all the RFPs will get the same root password set by means of a, I think they do something like, there is an overlay RAM FS, and then uh, ETC password is sort of mounted from that overlay RAM FS, and the ETC password file is copied from the central machine or something like that. So that the the login was actually it's it's uh, you cannot log in as root, but you log in as a known user, and then you can do su and and your root at the device, and that's you don't need to do any hacking. That's that's the way how you the, the equipment ships. Um, so your root on this, this is how a circuit board looks like if it is not zoomed correctly. Um, this is uh, more uh, like it, well the Ethernet sockets we don't need to want to see. So we have um, the circuit board here, you see lots of shielding covers. Uh, this is where the deck basement processor is located underneath and this is some whatever RF analog chain uh, related to it under those four shielding covers. Um, under this uh, heat sink is the Marvel Kirkwood, this is the RAM next to it, this is the NAND flash next to it. Um, here we have the Ethernet transformer, the PoE power supply, uh, this is the DC input, uh, this is the Ethernet jack and there's a USB-A interface uh, where you can attach uh, whatever peripherals. Um, it's quite interesting that they expose this and if you flip it around on the back side there's an MPCIe slot with USB so you can again uh, put in a, a Wi-Fi uh, no, it's actually, sorry, it's not USB, it's, it's an actual MPCIe with PCIe on it um, from the Kirkwood, so you can attach an, uh, a Wi-Fi card. The point is that you can basically deploy a combined DECT access point and Wi-Fi access point in a single device. And um, so uh, one of the first things I, of course, did is, I, since it runs Linux and it's an embedded device, uh, I made a test purchase. And interestingly, yes, it ships with a GPR and with a written offer. And I made an inquiry to the to the address that was stated uh, to get the source code for the Linux and so on. And the first very positive response was I got an automatic response from a request tracker. I was like, you, somebody else uses RT. That's great. Um, and uh, then there was apparently a, a person at the other end that even knew me. And I also vaguely remember the name from some, I don't know how many ages ago. I've read uh, this name before in the context of free software. and. Uh, very soon afterwards, I had a CD in my hand, or DVD, which uh, contained a uh, rather complete and building source code for all the free software on it. So uh, definitely they did that part right. Um, and it's actually a, depart like the, a subsidiary in Berlin that's doing the development, which I already suspected based on timestamps and some names that I could find in the, in the, um, in the firmware images and, and looking at the company history. So... Um, yeah, so you get the source code. Um, I think uh, they, what did they use? Was it build root? Uh, but the build system is rather easy to figure out which one was used and you can create a matching cross compiler and so on very easily and then uh, install your own binaries there. So the high level architecture to look at this again. Uh, we have our antenna going into the deck baseband processor and then we have the Marvel Kirkwood here. The main communication interface is this internal Ethernet. There's also a UART and some GPIOs. And the fun part is that the deck baseband processor apparently doesn't have any flash associated with it. It just has a ROM bootloader which makes it appear on the UART and then uh, the, the actual Ethernet bootloader is downloaded over X modem or whatever into over the UART into the deck baseband processor and then the remaining software is downloaded over Ethernet into the device and then they speak some proprietary internal Ethernet protocol here. And you have some GPIOs to toggle power and reset and so on to control the, 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 this processor. And uh, as I said, all of this is done from the rather standard uh, Linux here on the right-hand side. Um, yeah, U-Boot is from 2013 that exposes there. So you see there's 128 max RAM and uh, flash there. Um, the kernel boot log, well, uh, I'm not going to read this to you. You see the Marvel part number, and this is really exactly the same model down to the last digit that's used in those Shiva plug devices where Marvel has released the full manual for all the registers and everything uh, without NDA or anything. So it's really nice uh, to hack with. This is the partition map of the NAND flash. So you see U-Boot with persistent environment and the backup partition and flash file system and uh, uh, apparently uh, 
uh, var and they use UBFS for those um, uh, file systems there. Now, um, if you want to play with the firmware images, because actually the devices, they download their firmware over TFTP from the central server in the network. And if you want to look at this, there are these download files that are part of the official software releases, uh, IPRFP 3G, 3G is for third generation, not for 3G uh, uh, telephony, dot download. Um, and if you play with it and you find the offsets, then you can get the U image, the init RD and all that stuff uh, out and um, yeah, can basically investigate the root file system and so on if you don't want to do it on the live system. There are some interesting user space programs that you can find in there. Um, uh, the two main parts is the IPRFP program, which is really the, the, the program doing all the deck related stuff, which makes heavy use of a libom.so. Um, and then you see there are some .bin files, which are uh, the binary firmware images that are used on the DEC baseband processor. And by the way, none of this seems to use any cryptographic signatures or any kind of verifications whatsoever, so it's extremely hackable um, in a nice way. This is uh, not uh, criticizing. I'm very happy that uh, one can play with it. Um, yeah, so there's, interestingly, there is uh, the normal firmware, then there's something called macmoney.bin, which, yeah, well, it seems to be a Mac monitor firmware, but it's not documented or not used uh, by the normal code that we could uh, find. This has no documented feature about it, and there's, like, extremely comprehensive documentation about how you set up these systems and how you configure it and so on. Um, yeah, and then there's the bootloader itself, which is loaded over TTYS1 uh, over this UART internally. Now, if you, since you have these two Ethernet interfaces, what do you do? You start a TCP dump on this internal Ethernet interface, you get a PCAP file, you copy it off the box, and you start to analyze that. And you see there is lots of raw Ethernet frames with Ether types A000 to A004. Um, uh, and then you look at some string tables and uh, log outputs of different programs. By the way, all of these programs have something like a VTY that you can access, so you can interactively change the debug level and, and get protocol traces and so on, so it's really nice to explore. Um, and you have a logging system that's at least as complicated as ours. Um, and yeah, then you see there's uh, something interesting called audio log. Okay, so you can somehow log the audio of decked calls. It's for sure not a documented feature in, in, in the uh, documents that we have. There's an interestingly a separate for video. Uh, there actually is video telephony over decked, and believe it or not, when I was looking at the kernel strings, I also saw, oh, there's V4L, video for Linux. And I'm like, what, why do they have video for Linux on a deck base station? The point is you can attach a USB video class device to the USB-A connector on the deck base station. So not only do you have a deck base station and a Wi-Fi access point, but also you have a surveillance camera all in one PoE device. And then using a video decked phone, yes, they exist, um, you can use a video decked phone and you can see the real-time video feed uh, uh, over decked uh, uh, from the USB camera attached to your deck base station. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Why not? I mean... Um, Yeah, yeah. Well, you can do that from phone to phone, but I mean, that doesn't need any, any video for Linux in the kernel, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you have like indeed. So, yeah, so there's uh, the firmware download and so on. And the most interesting ones is really this A000 and A001. I don't really have any names, um, but if we look at uh, the protocols, I did some analysis. I will skip the details. There is uh, code in, in this branch in Wireshark.git. Um, and so uh, we have, uh, yeah, there's a couple of slides in the wrong order. So let's do the Wireshark demo quickly. Um, I basically have a capture file that I'll just show quickly in Wireshark. Um, no, this is not the right Wireshark. This is also not the right Wireshark. There's too many Wiresharks. Where did it go? Ah, there we go. This is the Wireshark. These are the Wiresharks you're looking for. Um, so uh, I'm just filtering on the A. I'm just filtering on the A00 frames, and I need to increase the font size, I guess. So um, if we look at the uh, the frame, 
structure there, we basically have this, um, let's also open the uh, hex dump. So we have the source and destination MAC addresses, then we have this unknown whatever frame type, then we have a two byte obvious length field of 61 bytes, and then we have some unknown payload in this case, uh, because I don't know this message yet. But here is a paging request, for example. So as an eight byte message with a paging request, and then there's some additional data back there, which probably is the whatever the the uh, what is it RFPI or whatever the the ad temporary identifier on deck uh, is uh, for the device that's supposed to be paged, and um, there is uh, yeah Mac modify confirmation and uh, whatever some other messages that are understood yet. Um, and here we actually see then an authentication reply of the DECT mobility management layer, which is, shows us that the stack is a bit deeper. So we have these raw Ethernet frames. At some point we have the DECT DLC layer, which is like LabDM. So we have an iframe with 21 byte links. And then we have the DECT network layer, which is an auth reply. And that is not decoded because there's no Wireshark uh, dissector for this protocol yet. But at least the RAS frame structure is understood. Um, and so this brings us to um, to these uh, protocol layer messages that we see here. So there are uh, messages and the names are mostly recovered from uh, looking at traces. So if you enable using the debug interface, uh, like their VTY, you can enable tracing and so on, and then you can map things. So you see there is like a connect indication, disconnect request, data request, data indication, page request, encryption key request, and so on. Modify request, modify confirmation, all sounds slightly similar, but slightly different at the same time. Um, and then in there, we actually have, uh, these are some more, um, where is it? Yeah, in there we do have, uh, in, in like the data request and data indication, we have the DECT DLC layer, uh, where Wireshark didn't have an existing dissector, but it was rather easy since DLC is a derivative of XDLC, like LabD and LabDM and LabSat and all these derivatives. So it was rather easy to create a dissector for the uh, DLC layer. And then we get to the NWK layer, which is the mobility management and call control, for which there's also no Wireshark dissector. That's why the decoding is rather um, simple. But all of these protocols are specified from this point on. So you could actually do complete protocol traces by writing some more Wireshark bits. Now uh, I wanted to look at the OMM RFP protocol in the last five minutes of uh, this uh, time slot. Um, that's the protocol uh, to remember looking at the diagram, no, not that diagram, that diagram. So right now we've basically looked at a protocol that's just purely inside here, inside the RFP between the DECT and the ARM core. Now we want to look at the backhaul protocol that's between the RFP and the uh, OMM. And this protocol has several subclasses. I tried to draw a tree of how, which sublayers are where. So we have this, what I called R MIDE, uh, um, and it has DNM and SYNC. And in DNM, you have MAC and LC um, and RFPC and HO. HO for sure is handover. RFPC is RFP control. So basically you can control, it's like OML uh, to control the base station. And these MAC and LC parts are to control the MAC layer and the logical channels in the device. Look Looking again at the protocol stack uh, diagram here, we see that the DLC layer is here and the MAC layer is over there, um, well, rather here. So we want to remotely control at the layer boundary between DLC and MAC, we want to remotely control that MAC layer over here. And that's what these primitives in the protocol are made for. Now, the funny part is, well, you enable all these logging and so on, and it gives you hex dump of the messages, but you never find those messages on Wireshark because they're actually encrypted or obfuscated. So uh, if you look at the TCP payload, um, it looks completely randomized. And uh, indeed, uh, they are using Blowfish um, uh, uh, library routines from their binary. So I made a small um, LD preload uh, wrapper library called libtracefish, which will basically give you a hex dump of all the plain text and cipher text for each of the functions calls and also a lib null fish which replaces the encrypt decrypt operations with mem copy and that you can basically you can basically switch to plain text mode and you can uh, analyze the protocol further and there are some people who have done more research on this and have done all kinds of interesting things but I didn't do that so I won't be uh, reporting about it um, but yeah it's uh, basically well understood now and one can not only trace this internal Ethernet interface, but also uh, the people have already implemented a man-in-the-middle proxy for this protocol between the RFP and the, the OM 
uh, where you can do modifications of uh, like my messages on the fly going uh, between the, the the core network and the uh, decked uh, phones that are attached to it. And that brings me to the end of file, and I can still take a couple of questions. Yeah, uh, we have a second microphone, which well. You so uh, after you explain a bit uh, the protocol, my doubt is so what's the point of the existence of this protocol? Like it seems really similar to GSM, and uh, GSM seems to be to have better uh, specs or yeah. So was it done before at the same time? And then so I don't know. Just um, I'm not an expert, but I think it DECT was created around the same time or shortly after GSM. It's definitely in the same time period. Um, the use case is different and I suppose the companies behind it are different. Um, you may have seen that the uh, DECT, uh, sorry, that the GSM spec specifies something called CTM DECT, the cordless telephony DECT. Uh, sorry, uh, CTM uh, uh, GSM, uh, cordless telephony uh, GSM. And um, uh, that was never uh, deployed. So apparently also people involved with GSM have uh, decided to extend GSM for cordless function uh, f functionalities, but it was never deployed there. Um, and uh, in terms of bands, uh, DECT is not an ISM band, but it's a, a freely licensed band in which it operates, of course. Um, uh, so I think it's uh, mostly different companies wanting to have different patterns uh, in different uh, specs uh, so they can monetize it. Well, the case for the band makes sense. Well, you, you could have just specified GSM yeah. for the same band, of yeah. course, if yeah, you yeah. wanted to. But uh, yeah, that apparently was not. Uh, there was actually a time when GSM decked dual mode phones existed. And uh, there were some countries where DECT local loop was used. Uh, so basically you would have your landline telephony over DECT. Uh, so basically like every street or so there's a pole with a DECT base station and you only have DECT phones at home rather than having copper lines. I think in India they did, uh, in some regions they did this for some time. So it was um, suggested as a local loop technology also around the time that ISDN uh, uh, was uh, deployed, a DECT can transport more than just telephony. So DECT from the beginning was uh, a telephony was more one application on it, um, which is specified in the, in the gap in the generic access profile in DECT, but there were other use cases and even in the mid 90s or so you could buy Siemens um, uh, let's say 128 kilobits over DECT uh, uh, transmitters and receivers. So um, you, you could actually do like two ISDN channels over DECT in your home uh, before wi uh, wireless uh, LAN came around and so on. And now we have all these new DECT IoT uh, devices that are being pushed by some industry players where again they use DECT only as the transport layer and have some other protocols on top. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question back there. Um, Which band? Uh, it's I don't know exactly. It's uh, somewhere 1.9 gigahertz. 1.9 gigahertz. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically it's above the GSM 1800 band. So directly above uh, this band uh, is where in Europe or at least in in this ITU region uh, there is a general. Um, uh, like a reservation for, for DECT. Uh, I think in the US, if you buy DECT phones, they have been modified to work on 2.4 gigahertz because they don't have this band. So actually use the same protocol, but shift it into the normal 2.4 gigahertz ISM band because they don't have this frequency allocation. Okay. Well, then that's it. So maybe a final word, uh, like, so what do we do with all of this? Well, I'm nothing really so far. There's no big plan. Uh, but at least if anyone ever wanted to implement uh, free software decked uh, stuff, I think with these base stations, um, it's rather easy to do. And there's not too many unknown factors or unknown variables anymore at this point. And, uh, 
uh, they are readily available. They can be bought on eBay. So if anyone wanted to implement all this uh, this protocol stuff uh, um, from DLC layer upwards, it's a little bit like what we did with the VS11 back then. Um, uh, one, one could do it now uh, without all having to do much reverse engineering now. Um, I don't think anyone will, but maybe, who knows. Um, okay, yeah, thanks.